Praise be Jesus Christ and welcome to Catholic Forum. I'm your guest host, Alan Dunst, and we really appreciate you joining our conversation. We hope by uh, joining our little conversation here, coming out of West Michigan, that uh, it might draw you closer to uh, Jesus Christ and his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Today, we're going to be considering finding one's purpose in, in life. Um, it's a tricky thing for anybody, but especially with for us you know, believers in God, we believe that we are created for something. And so we seek that thing, and it, sometimes it comes right to us, and sometimes we have to search for it. And, you know, it might be something simple, as easy as, you know, maybe just being a parent of a child is, is a, a holy calling. Um, whereas others might find their calling, you know, around the world and doing very challenging and difficult things that, you know, we might not even think that were possible. Um, but we're going to explore that with our guest tonight, who has actually had a very interesting life finding um, her passion and her calling. And um, so I want to thank uh, Gabby Shufflin for being with us here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you thank for you. being here. Um, now, you have a fascinating story, and so we're going to try to fly through in a half hour. So tell us about a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, you were... Um, Born uh, cradle Catholic? I was. So I was an absolute uh, classic cradle Catholic. Um, from the get-go, I was uh, introduced. We were very close to the Jesuit community. Mm -hmm. My mom was very close to the Jesuits running the local uh, church where I went to grade school. My family went you know, to high school. And so they really became very close from the get-go, literally when I was born. So it was not unusual to see some of the novices going through our home, staying while they were pursuing some of their studies. Our Friday nights were basically us and the Jesuits hanging out, you oh, know, nice. discussing whatever politics, although I was probably like <laughs> five at the time. Um, but it was very classic, you know, cradle Catholic. And uh, I always say my mom, thank goodness she's behind mm -hmm. my story now, because <laughs> she went through some tribulations too. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a, I would say a normal upbringing and Catholic, you, you know, again, grade school, middle school and high school. And I still went through my, you know, rebellious years and teenager years and trying to find myself yeah. and what have you. So, and this kind of became part of the journey and part of the sort of reconnecting with my faith. But I mm -hmm. think from the get-go, that mustard seed of faith and I think the way that I needed to at least come back to, you know, eventually was certainly put in, in place at the right time. Awesome. And so you were, so you had went to, you said Catholic schools all the way through? I did. Yeah. And uh, I actually went through, <laughs> the most challenging time was actually college, um, although I think my mom would say there was a huge period of it, <laughs> like last year that was challenging. But, and uh, after that, I ended up going to the Franciscan University in Steubenville, uh -huh. where I had a very challenging time as a rebellious kid. I decided, um, and it's funny because now, of course, now in the public eye, I get mm -hmm. to say I was actually, believe it or not, kicked out twice. Oh, my. Where I decided that it was my way. It was not following God's way. It was certainly, you know, this whole Catholic thing maybe wasn't for me. Mm. And so, you know, because I knew better, of course. You know, we all do. And at the time, it's funny, I, I know that inside of me there was something that knew and believed in God. I just wasn't ready to maybe embrace it full on because I thought that would make me boring, uncool, just I'm not understanding what this is all about. I'm not my mother, you know. Yeah, so right. you kind of go through your path. But, uh, you know, from, from the get-go, and thank goodness, my mom did a lot of humanitarian work and a lot of social work. And one of those, and one of those trips, she ended up going to the Dominican Republic when I was in middle school, okay. and she was working with some of the Carmelite sisters um, that had a mission uh, in, a, in a place called Banica. It was right, very close to the Haiti border, and she asked for myself and my dad to join her. So she was already there. So we ended up coming in a little later. Of course, I'm kicking and screaming because. My friends at the time were going to other more exotic places like <laughs> Bush Gardens and <laughs> Disneyland and Disney World and have, you know. And so I remember going, I don't, I don't get this, you know. Mm. And so ended up going to the strip and the first 24 hours were just, just devastating for me. I'm like, I can't believe I'm not on a ride right now. You know, why am I next to chickens and trying to go in, you know, dirt roads and I don't understand how this is affecting me or how this is good mm -hmm. for me. Right. 
and ended up going there. And I remember after that, when you kind of you know take away all of those me 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 moments and just sort of open yourself up to the opportunity. And God works in the way He needs to with each of us. Uh, I've always been very drawn to social injustices and just sort of you know seeking for equality for people and really fighting for those who can't fight for themselves for the oppressed. Mm -hmm. That's always been just a yearning that I can't explain other than God, you know, put that seat in me, and. I started seeing, you know, just the, the the difference and the disadvantages that these that these people had to face every day. You know, from getting water between rocks and not having medical attention. You know, we had a huge emergency that happened with a kid where we had to drive, I mean, hours to the closest hospital. You know, in jeep and dirt roads. You know, barely running out of gas, and, and it was just, you know, just such a challenge where you take all these things for granted, mm -hmm. and you start kind of putting things in perspective. And that always stayed with me as I was growing up, and. In college, I ended up, after I had my little moment at Franciscan <laughs> University, good Lord, um, I ended up going, um, I majored in theater, but I actually focused a lot on social political theater. Mm. And so got involved with a few organizations, um, including the Native American Lake Erie uh, Council up there. We did some kind of raising awareness to some of the injustices with the Native Americans. Um, I got involved in intercultural studies. I ended up going... Um, after I graduated from, from college, I ended up going to Honduras for a while with my mother again. And my faith was sort of, I would say, lukewarm at that point. I believed, okay. I prayed, but you know, more the Sunday uh -huh. Catholic uh -huh. moment, which sure. I think we've all been through. And, um, and after, I think after all that, you know, I ended up going to Honduras for a while with the, actually with the Jesuit priest that started this local theater called Teatro La Fragua. And what they do is they sort of raise social consciousness to the local people theater for the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talking about some of those oh, social injustices again. So I started seeing how art could actually combine with that social justice momentum and that interest that I had. And so that kind of kept me, I would say, grounded, so to mm -hmm. speak. And uh, sort of what led me to, you know, continue, I think, more in that Sunday Catholic role until later on where I really sort of started getting that call again, which is, I think, and I don't know mm -hmm. if we're going to talk about when, and later on when I got right. into corporate America, but um, that was sort of the, the path and the footprints as, as I, you know, continued on my journey. Okay, excellent. And since we're there, let's, let's talk about, you know, how you, you know, kind of continued on into more of a secular, um, you know, occupation. And t tell us a little bit, you know, kind of how that path went. Sure. So after um, I was done with, with uh, my college years and all my theater sort of running around, I did choreography, I did a little bit of all, all the sort of fun arts things that also um, sort of stirred my spirit, I would say. And I was actually pursuing film at the time. I actually wanted to be more behind the scenes. Yeah. And a few opportunities kind of threw me in front of the camera. I kind of wanted to be behind the camera. <laughs> so I really enjoyed that. I had um, actually a, a really interesting, and I, I say this is probably gut throwing a little something in the, in the corner just to say, well, maybe we'll see how this turns out. Uh, I actually am a survivor of melanoma, so which is the fastest uh, spreading uh, form of skin cancer, right. mm -hmm. and uh, which was pretty serious at the time. I had to rethink how I was, you know, even down to my health insurance. And so, out of need, I ended up going into corporate America, and I landed a job with Fox. I figured just for now, it was in entertainment and sports. I'm like, these are two. I was, I'm an ex gymnast, so oh, okay. sports are always in my, sure. you know, in my DNA. And I did track, cross feet. I'm like, this is excellent. One, you know, yeah. so uh, kind of a dream job, and I figured we'll do this and see how you know what do I do. So one thing led to another, and I ended up with various uh, positions with Fox for 14 years, and wow. that was unbelievable. I mean, I traveled and moved all over the country with them, um, and ended up in uh, in Florida, um, which is as of late where I was handling you know the southeast i was doing uh, marketing and distribution at the time for the sports and entertainment entities and including the caribbean as a territory mm -hmm. which is really rough <laughs> but that you know and i mentioned that because the money was fantastic the team was awesome uh, they were actually very supportive of anything and everything i think i brought to the table i was i'm very goal oriented so of course mm -hmm. the achievement the goals the paying job the things you could get the traveling it just gets to be so exciting and right. i get kept getting promoted things are just kind of looking good you start to become the oh it's it is about me uh -huh. it is it is i don't what else do i need faith yeah i think i i got easter cover yeah. christmas we're good and every now and again sunday things must be going right. I mean, things are going right. So yeah. I must be doing the right thing. And yeah. uh, so I think things were rolling, but I think at the same time I started feeling 
an emptiness in terms of what is, and I think you mentioned, what is my purpose? What is my mission? And these little flashbacks of, you know, what I did in Honduras, what I did in, Ban in, in Dominican Republic, it's almost like these flashes of just remember that. How, how are you fulfilling that? How are you connected to social justice? And I'm just sitting there and I remember thinking that at night, you know, I'm just, how, what, how, what kind of difference am I making when I go and have cocktails, you know, uh -huh. and talk about the, you know, how are the cubs doing? I don't mm. know, you know. <laughs> Wonderful though it may be, <laughs> um, but uh, again, it was it was almost the picture perfect story. I was I was you know happy with the job, but something was missing, and I started getting a really deep call to kind of look for something more. And one night, you know, talk about sort of organically happening. I watched this movie. I, of course, in the media, I loved movies, and um, there was this movie called The Whistleblower. And it was a true story about sort of talking about human trafficking in, in Europe, and it's an excellent movie how they, how they um, talk about that. But for whatever reason, I literally got up after that and I was just literally sobbing and just uncontrollably. And it was beyond me, this movie touched me, and oh my gosh, I sent some money somewhere and save a few people. Um, to I knew that I had to do something. And it sounds very dramatic, so I kind of hesitate to even say that because we're like, oh gosh, another one that gets moved by a movie and tries to go after, you know, let's go save the world. Um, but I think it touched all those points that had been building up to then. And at the same time, I even felt a call in my faith. Like I felt like I just needed to get down on my knees and start praying more. And that usually didn't happen when, you know, you get home from a Caribbean, you know, trip or, you know, the last thing you think about, unfortunately, for me at the time was praying. And I remember it really came hand in hand. And mm. I called my mom and I was like, you know, I just saw this movie, you know, bless her heart, because she's just been that pillar along the way. I call her my local saint connection and my mother, Teresa, who's always kind of, you know, patiently waiting for me to do whatever craziness I'm doing and, uh, and really wait for that moment when I come to her. And I did. I said, you know, I really feel this, this need to do something with social justice and human rights. And for some reason, law. I've always been drawn to law. There's lawyers in my, in my family. My sister, who's an amazing, brilliant lawyer, um, she had always been to, you know, kind of really encouraged me to go into law and practice. I'm like, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, you know, uh -huh. I'm an artist or a sports person. <laughs> right. I'm, you know, I don't do that. But certainly I always gravitate. I was the nerd. I was a closeted nerd looking up <laughs> stuff and working here and there on things related to law. And for some reason, those, those all kind of came together. They really clicked for me for some reason. And I told my mother about it. We ended up doing some research and came back around to the exact same school. And it was St. Thomas Catholic University. St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida, where I was living at the time. Oh. So it was literally down the street. As I Google this, I'm like, this is literally minutes down the street. So um, they had a fantastic program in intercultural human rights, which was just sort of uniting everything that I had been thinking about, talking about human trafficking was one of the topics. Mm. The um, director was very involved in human trafficking. Her name is Rosa, Dr. Rosa Patti, and she is coincidentally on the uh, she's the only U.S. representative in the Council for Justice and Peace, appointed by the Pope. So this kind of, you know, also connected her a little more to what I think, you know, the faith was calling me to do. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. wow, um, my mom ended up talking to her. I'm thinking, you talk to, this is my school, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> but for some reason, it, it didn't bother me. And I was like, you know, organically, just sort of all happened. I, I think I, I had to beg, borrow, and plead because I was actually not, I'm not a lawyer by trade. Um, so it was a very big exception and ended up getting accepted to, to the program. Uh, I'm sure under you know, 10 pages worth of, you know, if you do or you, know, you better do, if not, you're out of the program. And, uh, and one thing led to another. I was actually at the time working full time still with Fox wow. and completely devoted. I'm you know, extremely um, loyal. If I'm working on something, that's where my head is at um, and going to school full time. And so it was a very trying time. And I will tell you, I had this amazing, un endless energy that I knew was beyond me. And beyond that, I ended up, I mean, I think I slept like an average of two hours a night, you know? And wow. to see this unraveling, I'm looking around me, there's faith in everything that I'm doing. My faith is actually going up, you know? And I'm thinking, this is crazy. I'm going now to church, shocking, daily mass. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> confession, because if my mother has only been saying this since I was born, go to confession. You know, and I couldn't even remember anything. What am I supposed to do? It's been a gazillion years since my last confession. You know, How, what is it like to be a Catholic? I missed on, you know, Bible stuff. What am I doing? I don't even know what I'm doing. It was a really crazy sort of awakening and relearning of my faith. Interesting. So it was almost like I was trying to be a full-time Catholic. 
a full-time, um, you know, student, a full-time uh, worker. Um, you know, as the as the the process continued, I think um, you know I realized that this was God leading the way, and my believe it or not, I graduated valedictorian with honors. I was asked wow. to be the chief co-editor of the Intercultural Human Rights Law Review, and all this while I still had a full-time job. To me, I always think of Mother Teresa saying, you know, I'm God's pencil. I just kept saying, I must be God's laptop right now because <laughs> it's not just me. So one thing led to another, and that was my, my master's. After that, I just felt that call to continue it on, and this is where I am now and kind of uh, full-time focusing. I'm pursuing my, my PhD right now mm -hmm. on specifically on human trafficking, uh, looking at the role of culture and the role of media and comparing India, uh, the United States, and then Latin America and the Caribbean. Oh, my. So you, you just left Fox, you said, when was it, back in January, is that right? So I did. I, you know, I, I had put this in a lot of prayer and really kind of thinking, am I really taking this jump? I mean, am I really thinking I'm going to completely do a 180 and leave the comfort of, mm -hmm. you know, again, great office, great team, travel, everything, and really focus on this full time? I mean, this is nuts. And I remember calling my mom at some point. I'm like, I'm getting ready to go St. Francis on us. You know, like I'm ready to go sell <laughs> everything. And, you know, and again, another movie she had cemented, you know, <laughs> planted there a long time ago, sister, uh, brother, son, or brother, step, brother sister, brother, sister. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, all this stuff was behind somewhere in my, in, my, in my heart and in my head. And of course, I'm sure God's having just a field day looking at this. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm really feeling like, I started feeling this detachment of things, which was really amazing and very liberating. And I think that was, I had, I had done some secular reading, but it's a, it's, it was a book that talked about shedding, just simply shedding things that are taking up too much space in your life. And I remember that. And right around that time when I was sort of, you know, starting to get into my PhD, I'm like, wow, this is, there's something there that I started to not care about things, and which was very strange for me. And... Um, again, keep in mind my faith is on its way up, and I'm just I'm literally devouring books and devouring things that my mom had said to me a gazillion years ago, and I just didn't pay attention. And you know, and with all this, all of a sudden my supervising professor, which I mentioned, Dr. Rosa Patti, um, for the PhD, she mentioned you know um, she was actually going on sabbatical in the spring, this spring 2015. And she had been invited um, a long time ago or a couple of times to go to India to give some, some talks on human rights and human trafficking. For whatever X reason, she had not been able to go. This time she said, you know, I'm going on sabbatical. The timing works out. What do you think about joining me on the trip? And I'm like, you're kidding me. And of course, I'm thinking, there is no way. She's going for a month. There is no way that my job, although they were so accommodating, and I, I will tell you, that was part of my journey and the path because you know, they, they were really, truly amazing through through the whole process, and I learned so much, you know, and I know that that has, that there's there's a piece mm -hmm. of that that works into the journey. But uh, I realized this is probably a time that needs to shift. I mean, this is becoming a reality. And after that, I figured, you know, this is a good time for me to also go on my own. So we ended up sort of wrapping it up with Fox in January, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter, I'm jumping on a plane, head to India with my professor, and... PhD in full swing mm -hmm. and full, new life in yeah. full swing. You so. still got to travel though. I still got to travel, <laughs> so that was a good thing. So yeah, no, and that was just an amazing kickoff. So yeah, so it's just uh, really amazing to when you as you're going through this and it doesn't, you know you can kind of see how the grace is just kind of playing in through this and just kind of guiding the way for you and putting things in place. And Somebody's orchestrating. You just have to <laughs> figure out how to get out of the way, and a lot of us are control freaks and type A, so we mm -hmm. got this, you know, mm -hmm. so when you decide just to let go a little bit and start seeing, I think, the signs and really understand this as, as confirmations, and I don't believe in coincidences, so I believe someone else is, is sort of taking the reins at, you know, sure. at times, and if you let him, <laughs> um, and I think that that's when you just, it's just, it's ridiculous what happens, you know, but I had to learn the long and, you know, exhausting way, I guess, so. Right. Um. So let's, uh, let's go to India. What, what happened there? And can, tell us about your experiences and uh, what you learned there. Sure. So India was, you know, like anything else, well, you don't know. I've lived abroad. I mean, I, was, I, I would say I come from a, a house that, you know, is pretty much like the United Nations. If you can believe it, my mom, my dad, my siblings, and I were all born in different countries. Oh, my. Um, or I would say different locations. But um, 
So I had lived uh, in Puerto Rico, Germany, obviously the U.S., and so I had that feeling of, of, of living abroad. I knew different cultures from the get-go. I've traveled, obviously, with my mother to different parts of the Caribbean, Central America, so I had a little bit of that uh, outside of worldly experience. And I figured, India, just another one, you know? <laughs> And I've, but I've never been to the southeast. I've never or to the uh, southeast Asia. I've never been to out to the east. And so this was a interesting proposition. Of course, you hear a lot, and there's a lot that you know is in the media, and there's a lot that you hear about India and the culture. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, when I get there, especially towards women, you know. And mm -hmm. I'm a woman traveling, sure. so I think that's something that's it, there's a reality to it, and you have to take that into consideration. Of course, I'm also very adventurous, and I'm very uh, intrinsically motivated to dig a little deeper than most. And so I was kind of excited about what was ahead. It was, I said, you know, divine providence. My teacher was going. It was a perfect sort of way to, to come in. I got to meet just so many people from different, you know, fellow law colleges, uh, government officials, uh, different human rights organizations. And so that was just an amazing time for me to sort of sit back and really observe the culture, which is what I'm interested in. So my focus, again, is human trafficking. And mm -hmm. I think the, you know, there's laws out there, and that's part of where I'm focused on right now is, you know, there's definitely laws, and they could always be better. But a law is words on a piece of paper that hopefully we're looking and abiding by mm -hmm. and enforcing, first of all. But it's really, you know, who, who are, who's really following those laws? And it's, it's us, it's everybody, it's the culture. And so what elements in the culture are either preventing us from following those laws or not quite, you know, getting us to say, you know, this is what's creating the human trafficking problem to begin with. And so I wanted to kind of go a little bit deeper into the difference in each of our cultures, not just over there in India, but also here in the mm -hmm. U.S. and like I said, in, in Latin America. And so I really started being an observer and just, you know, looking at uh, what India, which is gorgeous, people are, you know, just a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, people are very warm. Um, you know, of course, I'm looking at religion, which is part of culture. And it was a, a very, a very new feeling for me to be the minority mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, Christianity is probably, and again, no, I don't hold me to the, my feet to the fire on the, on the, the, the statistics, but I think it's like tw about 22% when you're in the su south of India, which we started our tour, so to speak, in Kerala state and Karnataka state, which are the southernmost part, sort of coastal uh, lines, and, and traveled a little bit around. Um, of course, you have St. Thomas, who uh, sort of brought um, most of that to, to, to southern India. Um, and then you start, and then you see, of course, Hinduism, Muslim, and that's, that's a, it's a big contrast. We're not used right. to that here. Right. And then as you move uh, north, which I ended up when I stayed behind on my own, which is a little scarier as a woman traveling alone in India, it's a reality that, again, with my explorer hat on and you know, uh, sort of adventurous spirit, and I know that there was a, I know there's a lot of people praying for me. They still are. My mother, I think, has not left the church, you know, <laughs> since I think I left for India. But um, I, I felt the the calmness, even though I knew that there was very dangerous situations. I felt that calmness to keep going, and I would put everything in prayer every step I took, as I did get into some really scary situations mm. as a woman. And but. Uh, you know, when you go up to the north, the Christianity drops to two percent. And when I was there, I think um, there was uh, there was a story that uh, broke about um, some uh, a few priests and a few nuns that had actually gone to prison doing a demonstration. Um, and it's just you start to see this tension that we're not used yeah. to seeing in this country. So it was very a very different, you know, element. But you know, going back to the human trafficking, you start seeing um, there's a uh, social strata, so to speak, structure, the caste system, right. which certainly adds to sort of the elements or the push factors, aside from poverty um, and other sort of need factors that maybe force people or entice them or put them very in a very vulnerable position to that gets them into these human trafficking sort of um, situations. I would say that the caste system is, is, is that vulnerability. And caste system is really, I, I almost compare it to our civil rights movement in, you know, in this country, where in the 1950s, when, they had, when India had a new constitution, the, any kind of discrimination against what they call the untouchables, the very bottom of that caste system was outlawed. So there's a law that outlawed that discrimination mm -hmm. that basically said no more. But the practice, the right, culture, right. does it really continue? And these are the vulnerable folks, the oppressed, you know, folks that we need to look at when it comes to things like human trafficking. Right. So it was very eye-opening. I bet. Um, and we're, we're running out of time, so yes. I want to I try to focus a couple things. Um, in terms of your learning, and, and, you know, we talk about, you know, 
obeying the laws that are in place, you know, and, and certainly in America, we're at, a, at this time, you know, uh, when we're recording this, we're, we're kind of living through that with the, uh, the whole Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. trafficking of humans, mm -hmm. literally, uh, kind of a scary thing. Um, but what you were talking about um, earlier, you were saying that there's uh, basically three things that, you know, that people should know about uh, human trafficking. What would they be? So, and I'm wondering what I said before, but I think, <laughs> so you have to help me out, but I think, <laughs> cheat, I like it. Um, I think one of them would be expected to be everywhere. You know, I think most people, and it's great that I think we talked a little bit about India, and I try to bring it back to the mm -hmm. U.S., but it's everywhere. It's not just something that happens over there. I think there's been a lot of efforts put towards education and awareness, where I think that, you know, we're not in the same place we were a couple of years ago, where I mentioned human trafficking, and people were kind of like, and I'm not sure what that is, you know. Mm -hmm. And so now you have some sort of reaction. It's, it's still kind of a fuzzy picture at times, but it's not something that's happening abroad. It's something that's happening here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and very much in our backyard. You know, it's what, what do we picture? You know, what does a person look like? It can look like anybody. So, and I think that's probably yeah. another one yeah. that I had mentioned is that it's not just women. It's not just, you know, Caucasian women. It's not... To, uh, girls, it can be boys of all nationalities, it can be men, again, of all nationalities, women, children, it affects anybody. So, I mean, human beings are, are being forced and coerced into situations mm -hmm. where they're made into commodities, forced to do something for the benefit of somebody else. Right. So, um, and, and that can take any, I mean, and again, I think maybe the other one is um, the fact that it's not just sex trafficking, you know, because I think a lot of people think about human trafficking as just of, you know, in a sexual sort of connotation, but there's labor trafficking, there's domestic servitude, there's organ trafficking, you know, and I think you mentioned the Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. but so there's, it comes in, again, it affects everywhere, everyone, and certainly in various forms, and I think we need to be aware of that. Yeah, um, so given that, how broad that is, mm -hmm. what can people do to work against that? Kind of what I hit in the beginning in terms of awareness, you know, mm -hmm. education, 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 like anything else. If it means educating yourself, there's a great organization called, and it's probably one of the most popular ones, polarisproject.org. Mm -hmm. Great website just to kind of get your feet wet and mm -hmm. understand a little bit more about what it is. Um, you can get, of course, a little deeper with the United Nations. And um, also the State Department puts out what's called a traffic and in-persons report, the TIP report. And they actually do a great job at looking. Now, keep in mind, it's the U.S. perspective. But they do have um, sort of system that they break down a report by country. So okay. you can actually look it up that way. And they have a tier rate as, in terms of how they think a, a country's doing. So if they're doing, you know, if they have the laws and they're abiding by them, they're a number one or, you know, mm -hmm. a three. And if they're not, but they're making efforts, they're a two. And so they, you can kind of see where, how we rate across, uh, you know, index across the world. Elise Hilton, I want to make sure I give her mm -hmm. proper credit, but she was mentioning how, and she made, put out a quote, which I thought was interesting, how we're sort of in the same place, you know, just by comparison, where we were with child, uh, child uh, abuse and domestic abuse 30 years ago, where mm -hmm. people were sort of very afraid to get involved. Get involved, you know, and there's safe ways you can do that. A tip, um, there's uh, now resources that are starting to come out, the hotlines that you can call and put a tip out uh, anonymously or get a little more involved. Call your local cops. Hopefully <laughs> they'll be a little more versed as to what's going on, and they are. There, there's a lot more awareness that's happening in the law enforcement community, a lot more efforts. Uh, there's an app also, uh, Red Light Traffic, that you can send an anonymous tip. So get involved, and if you see something that's a little off, certainly yeah. you know make, make, that, make that extra effort Step and kind of call it in. Absolutely. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have to kind of draw the close there um, because of time, but uh, fascinating. I wish we could uh, spend another half hour and here. We probably could. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to thank you for being thank with us so here, Gabby. Much. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us as well. And um, hopefully uh, this is giving you some food for thought in terms of just you know, the, the, the ideas of you know, finding one's uh, purpose and not to mention human dignity. We hope you'll join us again. In the meantime, we'll keep praying for you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.